Welcome to Stoughton Media Access Cable's Community Forum Show. My name is Steve Kelly, and today I have the pleasure of bringing you the Stoughton Visiting Nurse Association, which is actually the Stoughton Public Health Association. And I have with me, as our wonderful guest, Janice Bruce and Teresa Dulloff. So welcome and thank you for being on the show. Oh, thank, thank you for having you. us. You guys do such valuable work. I mean, I don't know if people um, could possibly like garner enough of the evidence that they need to make an assessment of what you guys do. So I'd like you guys to do that on today's show, is just tell us all the wonderful things you do, the service that you provide. Um, so maybe you could start. What is your position at the Stoughton Public Health Association? Okay. Um, I'm the director of the VNA and Public Health Association, and our legal name, as you just mentioned, is the Stoughton Public Health Association, okay. but we're also the visiting nurses in Stoughton. Um, so they're not one and the same, but they are? Oh, well, let's clarify that because it's confusing. It is kind of confusing. Um, for, for our legal name, and we did try to change it over to uh, the visiting nurses, but legally through all of the government in Medicare, we're the Public Health Association, but we actually are a public health, which most towns have a, a public health nurse. Yeah. But we also are very unusual because we have a certified VNA within that department. So, so the, a certified VNA does not mean one person. What, what is a certified VNA? Okay, the visiting nurses, um, we're certified through uh, DPH and Department through of Public Health. Department of Public okay. Health in Medicare um, that we're able to provide certified home care services which are covered under patients insurance. The public health is more a town would have it and it's sort of a service built into the town but as the VNA we're able to go in and see um, under doctor's orders we're able to go into a patient's home and provide whatever services that are ordered whether it be um, checking their their blood pressure because they've had medication changes. It's a, it's a skilled need that would be covered under their insurance. Oftentimes it's uh, doing disease uh, assessment and teaching or uh, someone came home from the hospital and they needed a nurse to come in and, and see how they're doing and uh, maybe it ha involves a post-surgical type of situation. So we go in and we are able to assess what they need. Um, we provide the skill services, which are skilled nursing, um, physical therapy, speech therapy if they need that, um, occupational therapy, home health aid. So we just so there's so many so things. It, there's so, a, a so lot let me, of different things. Let me interrupt things. you, and, and, sure. and I want to bring you back to some more questions about that. Okay. But before I do, I want to bring Teresa yes. in. Yes, <laughs> Teresa, tell us your role at the Stoughton Public Health Association. I'm the community liaison nurse. So what that means is I'll go out to different facilities that would give us referrals and I screen the patients, get all the information that we need so that we're prepared when the patient's ready to come home to provide the services that they need. So you've done this a long time because they wouldn't put somebody in that position screening potential input unless you knew a lot about it. So tell us a little bit about your experience. Well, I haven't necessarily been with the visiting nurses for very long. I've only had that experience for two years. but. Uh, my background's in physical and neurological rehabilitation. Um, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> so we just go out and we screen patients, and I bring back the information and get them set up so that when they are home, there's a, a continuity of, of care transitioning from either a hospital or a rehabilitation. What's your favorite part of the job? I think it would be interacting with patients. But that's always, I think nurses in general, that's why we do the work that we, that we do. We're, we're nurturers, we're caretakers. So it's always great to interact with a, a patient, see them um, when they have so many needs progress to a level that they want to be, a level of independence and, and health. And, and that's what you sort of pull that together with your team. Correct. So tell me a little bit about your background in terms of schooling. I, I'm, I would think somebody watching uh, an aspiring healthcare person might want to hear so what was your background to be able to do this? Well, a long, long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I went to um, Brockton Hospital School of Nursing. And the reason why I chose Brockton Hospital School of Nursing was because it was a very hands-on program. And that's the kind of, that's the kind of learner that I am. Um, I initially always thought I wanted to do pediatric care. Um, but turns out I don't like sick kids. Um, <laughs> 
it, it's awful to see a child sick. Um, but what I did fall in love with was the physical and neurological rehabilitation piece of it because you see such growth in progress. Is that um, for like strokes and things like that? Strokes, um, hip replacements, lots of different neurological disorders and whatnot. You just see such progress and it's, it tends to be a longer term care process so you can build relationships with patients and families. And, that, and that's important to me. Yeah, so that, what would you say to an aspiring nurse or, or, or a person who you see would come to fill in the ranks, say, 10 years from now when, when you're ready to, like, uh, maybe give, do some mentoring? What would you say to the, uh, that person? Geez. Um, give it your all. Give it, give it your heart. When you care for your patients, just don't care for them with your mind. Care for them with your, with your heart. Um, and always incorporate as much of the family as you can because when you treat a patient, they're not... They're not an island. Oh, what wonderful um, advice. Uh, I mean, that the idea that, especially about you're not treating just with your brain, number one, and number two, that you're treating the whole family, that's really great advice because anytime I've ever been sick, my family's involved. It's just, right. and, and if they're not, I get them involved because I'm grouchy. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so those are some, like, positive, like, that, Maybe they don't have that in the book, per se, the book learning that you do around neurology, right? Oh, correct. I mean, you, you have to learn all your clinical pieces and whatnot, but caring for a patient is, you know, you have to be supportive to them. Usually when patients are, are ill, they're, they're frightened. They don't know what to expect, and as, as nurses, we have to provide them compassion and, and, and comfort. We can give them all the skilled care that that they need, but unless they're they're comfortable and and relaxed, um, they're not going to heal as well. Wow! So I do a little teaching, and um, I have I start every class off by telling everybody that you won't learn unless you feel safe in the classroom. So it kind of matches. Well, I'm also I'm also a teacher. I teach preschool as well. So yeah. I I agree with that completely. Yeah. So you've got to make the feel patient, connected. Yeah, and if people don't feel safe with a doctor or a medical uh, professional, then they're not perhaps going to ask the right questions, they're not going to push back when they should. Or they don't share as much information with you. And th the information the patient gives you is the key piece of treating them. Yeah. Wonderful. So that brings us, let's segue right back to um, <laughs> what I wanted to ask you before we get Teresa's input was um, how many um, VNAs are held in the, uh, the, the hold, let's say, or, or by, by towns like this in Massachusetts. Right. Okay, so we are um, only one of two VNAs that are town owned in Massachusetts, so we are a unique feature for the town. Okay. And I think it's a real strength for the town because um, we're able to connect up with other town departments. So when we go in and see a patient, we feel like they're part of our community and we're able to really access other um, other services in the town, whereas we, we know these people that I feel like they kind of belong to us. Okay. Yes. And then when we go in there, they feel a connection because we're with the town. And so I might go in there, or, or I'm not on the road anymore, I was for 20 years, but uh, if they go, if a nurse goes in, they may say, you know, I think you could really benefit from, you know, seeing somebody at um, the Council on Aging, mm -hmm. you know, the services connect that they right provide, within connect the town right network. within the yeah. town. Or sometimes we'll get a call maybe from um, the fire department saying, gee, you know, we have somebody that we're a little concerned about. Could you go out and make a wellness visit and just do a check on them? So I think these are the features that might be a little uh, different for and our a lot organization. Of continuity by having it in the town so that the next visit isn't right. somebody that's never heard of the right. patient or doesn't even know the road they live on. Or, exactly, or and all of our nurses and our staff in our office uh, offices mostly have either been connected by growing up in Stoughton or have uh, have a strong tie to Stoughton. Yeah. So I think that it's, there's just a certain comfort level by saying these are our nurses and we don't, we've had the same nurses and clinicians for a lot of years. How many? How many do you have in the So in the we have, um, Every day on the road, we have two full-time nurses, but then we have a handful of um, per diem nurses that fill in yep. when we might need them. And then we have uh, like two OTs, uh, three OT, oh, occupational therapists. therapists. Yeah. I'm sorry, I you gotta know, remember to sure give you the right words. Yeah, in case um, they're not right 
Well, and uh, like they three, might know it, but can't remember right. it. That's, three physical that's usually therapists. my problem. I, I know yeah. it, but I can't remember. <laughs> right. I know I shouldn't use the acronyms, but three uh, physical therapists, uh, a social worker. Wow. So yeah. So uh, in there hasn't been a lot of turnover, so the, the help has stayed fairly consistent. So it's funny, we may not see somebody for a few years and then we'll get a call back and they're like, oh, it's my nurse or it's my therapist. Yes. Or sometimes they'll say, gee, I had, you know, I had this therapist last time. Are they still with you? And we're like, yes, because yeah, we'll we do <laughs> see, seem to retain yeah. um, th our staff, right. which is really great because it's just um, a sort of a level of, um, knowing each other and working together in comfort and the patients really enjoy it too. So it's not, it's a, it's a little bit different. All right. So I'm going to, um, not right away switch to uh, Teresa and ask her about the flu, but before I do, I want to ask you the same question I asked Teresa, an aspiring, um, medical person or want to be medical person, um, maybe not one yet. Um, <laughs> how would they follow in your, um, career footsteps? How did you get started? Where did you go to medical school? When did well, you start? Uh, don't give the dates. Right, no. <laughs> I actually, <laughs> it's funny. I, I think um, what really inspired me was, and I know it's like your inspiration story, but was when my grandfather, when I was in high school, got sick and he was in a nursing home. And I, when I saw how caring the nurses were to him, and I felt he was in a safe place, and I felt he was being nurtured, it inspired me to want to seek out a uh, nursing career. So it's oh. funny, my, actually my high school guidance counselor, when as soon as I mentioned that, he picked up the phone and got me a nurse's aid job right away at, at a local nursing home in Stoughton. Oh. So it was, it was great. I was a nurse's aide there for years in Alder and I went to um, a local community college. Which one? I went to Massasoit Community oh, College for my, good, for my associate's oh. degree. Do you know that the, the, the community colleges are in even greater value today than they were then? Yep. Because the, the cost of education has skyrocketed, yeah. and, and I think with the negative effect on people, and right. yet the community colleges are still doing a good job holding the line. Right. And um, that's a great value. Right. So you, you were able to right. capitalize on that And value. at that time, of course, going back in the 70s, um, it was... 80s, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> It was, you know, to become a nurse, like there were several different paths that you could follow, and yeah. it was like... Um, your associate's degree, or you could go for a hospital diploma school, like Teresa went for a diploma mm -hmm. school. But we're all certified through the state um, of Massachusetts for, we all take the same state exam to become registered. So it was after that I got into, um, I really loved geriatric nursing. And oh. that was really what inspired me um, by taking care of um, elders. I felt like we were sort of, uh, a lot of times advocates for them when they didn't have a, a special family. soul, by the way, to, oh. to want to take care of people that are like, um, and I want to be delicate in how I frame it, but also just straight on, but to want to take care of people that are sort of losing um, some of their skills, right. that, that takes a real, like a real compassionate soul, doesn't it? Well, I, mean, I, 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 you know, I like to think compassion is something that um, anyone that's in the healthcare field has. You know, you would hope that they would have compassion, but I remember thinking that this might be the only, you might be the only person that they may see all day, basically, and you would hope that you bring something to their life. Like, so wouldn't that be a nice, like, not a speech, but a nice little piece that you would give every aspiring person to come right. in? Is, uh, don't bring a computer, bring compassion into their lives. Right. I guess well, I think that's what's happening right. now is they, they want to bring a computer into everything. Right. And, and, and how about we just like right. look to how we can right. bring, you know, if you are the only one in their lives today, how would you bring compassion and right. kindness instead of a computer right. in their life? Which, right. tell me this, when were you born? I know, I I mean, know that, exactly. Every time you go to the hospital, it's this right. cascading, momentum building, information right. snatching, uh, like a, a process right. that is just so um, right. foreign. And maybe I'm, I'm speaking no, only no, for myself. No, 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 it's maybe absolutely I'm the only true. One who thinks that way. No, we, know. we really do like that personal um, relationship and that personal touch. And, and especially in home care, like if you're in a facility, like I went worked nursing homes and then I worked at New England Sinai Hospital and worked again with a lot of long term care patients. Um, but in home care, literally, you may be the only face that they see that day. Like yeah. if they live alone and you're going in to see them, or whether you're a health aide or a nurse or whatever, 
do you want to be the face of, you know, do you want to be all serious and, and uptight and grouchy? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, because you know. you're going to leave them right. be- the world is exactly. uptight and grouchy. You right? might be the only only person. So, um, you know, you want to have a, that, and I think that's what our office does. We have a lot of uh, joyful people that work there. It starts at the top. You know. <laughs> it does. I mean, you, I firm believe that, that the culture is something we can't see in a business, but we all feel it. And, and that starts at how the, the, the things that you generate, um, like silently, like right. roll, vibrate, vibrate right. is a better word, vibrate through your organization. So congratulations right. on that. Well, we have, a, we have a really joyful group. In fact, want to show this picture of talking about patients? Ah, oh, let's get Leo, we, by the way. Wanna <laughs> quick, let me just quickly interrupt. So I want to say thank you. We have Roy Cohen out in the back. He's uh, doing our executive director work out back uh, producing the show and uh, we also have Leo McGowan he's going to run the cameras right now as you hold the picture up and these guys uh, in addition to needing the care that these women offer they're also working very hard behind the camera so please. (laughs) So I just think um, I wanted to talk a little bit about we had entered a contest and it was put on by the an organization that we belong to is the Massachusetts um, Home Care Alliance, which is an okay. advocacy group for all home cares in Massachusetts. Okay. And we were very happy. We won a photo contest. And I can see why this one. This is our nurse Rhonda and okay. one of our patients. I'm going to hold right. it up. Leo, can you zero you in on this. this on this photo for us? So we, we have it on the main camera, <laughs> but let's see if we can get a zero in. Just hold that very still, and Leo will pull that right okay. up. So just to tell you a little bit about this, so all these pictures were entered and they were hanging in the state house in Massachusetts and people could vote. So all the home care agencies put their pictures pictures in and then it came down to this and this was our winning photo. So we won out of all the ones, but I think it shows the relationship of our nurse Rhonda, who's been Uh with us for 17 years and a patient that we've had off and on during the years, and she's very happy to be on this calendar. She's giving it to her doctor. She's really <laughs> pleased. This is a 92-year-old lady that had um, had hip surgery and came through it really well with her all of her services. And um, it shows a day in the life of a home care nurse and their patients. So I was really happy about that. I think the, the photo really captures too that whole compassion piece that we were that we were talking about. I mean, they're just so connected there. I love that picture. Yeah. So, so we um, walk us through um, a typical visit with uh, someone concerned about the flu. So, well, someone concerned about the flu. You I get think a call I, and someone I says, I, "I'm sniffling. I don't feel good." Could you have somebody come out? Is that something you guys do, or do you send them to the doctors, well, or what happens? Well, if it's one of the patients that we're seeing, then we would address it when we were, when we were there in the home. But okay. um, all of our patients, and certainly anyone in the community, can call us and, and chat with us. We do have um, something on Thursday afternoons called Converse with a Nurse, um, oh. that anyone from the community can come into the visiting nurse's office and bring their health questions or so concerns. So Thursdays, Converse with a Nurse starts at 1 o'clock um, till 4 o'clock? Four. What does it do? Four o'clock until six o'clock. Oh, good. In the Four evening. to six on Thursdays. Converse with a nurse. <laughs> Converse okay. with a nurse. So, if someone from the community that we weren't necessarily seeing as a patient had a question, they can come and chat with us at that point, or they can they can pick up the phone and give us a call. There's there's usually someone in the office who can answer their their questions. But because the flu is what it is this year, it's sort of a hot topic with with everyone. Um, we talk a lot about flu prevention and how in, how important it is to do particular things like be careful about not going out when you're ill, not being around other people who are sick, um, washing your hands, washing your hands, washing your hands. <laughs> <laughs> so washing your hands is really important. What about sanitizer? Do you recommend that? I hate that stuff, but what do you tell me about that? Certainly the best thing to do is to wash your hands with soap and water, but if it's not available, then hand sanitizer is the best thing, yeah, the, best, the best thing to do. <laughs> it's just, you know, it's, it, it's germs are out there but you're and in they're a restaurant, so prevalent right. and yeah. you just, you want to try to keep it a, as quelled as possible. So washing your hands, staying away from people who are sick, staying home when you're sick, not going to school, not going to work. Not going grocery shopping, not going to the movies. So how would that help? I don't understand. Staying home, if you're sick already, there's nothing to lose. Go out. 
Right. Tell well, me why I'm it's, wrong. it's everyone else. So if I came oh, on and I had the yeah. flu <laughs> and I'm coughing all over you, chances are you're going to be sick okay. and Janice is going to be yeah. sick. And okay. So you're expecting me to be sick. I feel really bad. Now you want me to be some sort right. of humani <laughs> humanitarian <laughs> and not go off. No. Right. Oh. <laughs> but if you, if you think you're getting the flu and if you can get to a... Um, like a clinic or to call your doctor, you might be able to start on. They can test you with a with a nasal swab to see if it actually is the flu, and they'd start you on Tamiflu, most likely, or an antiviral right. medication to hopefully make it so it, you'd not get as sick. All right, I've already jumped way ahead, so let me pull you back in case there's anyone else as, let's say, dumb as I am. What's, what is the flu? What is that? I mean, it seems such an amorphous term. It's different every year. It's, it's like, it really makes me wrinkle my eyebrows. <laughs> what is the flu? Well, the flu is a, a, a cause, obviously, by a virus. It's not obvious to me, but oh, go okay. ahead. The flu is caused <laughs> there's a by million, a virus. It's a, there's a million viruses out there, but some are potentially would make you sicker. And when they prepare a flu vaccine, they try to target the viruses that they suspect are going to be the worst ones to call, cause the flu. The flu Who's virus. Who's they? Uh, the Centers for Disease Control. Um, Don't they have like better things to do, <laughs> like smallpox? And, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they do those so, too. So, uh, <laughs> but thank God we don't have so much of that anymore. Okay. Um, but they would they would target, and the vaccine you get would have certain wouldn't just fight one one virus. It would fight so many different viruses but it seems like every year there's always one virus that's not either not targeted they didn't expect it it seems like like this year there's a, a certain virus that they say is very changeable and it's a little resistant so this is why this year they're saying the flu is a little worse because the um, flu vaccine may not be hitting that particular virus but certainly there's a lot of other viruses you're getting protected from with the flu shot so, um, Teresa, mold a bigger picture or, or, or closer, tighter picture about c contracting the flu through a virus. What are we talking about there? Let me see if I understand your question. Um, it's like medicine for dummies. <laughs> so if I have the flu, for instance, um, I'm carrying this in my body. If I'm sneezing or if I'm coughing, that virus is contained in the water droplets when you cough and when you sneeze. Well, if I sneeze and then it becomes airborne, whoever's in that environment breathing <laughs> um, will breathe in that, that virus, those germs, those bugs. And then that has a potential taking hold in their body. So, and that's how it spread from person to person. So what is it about the virus, the germs, that's making you sneeze? I, I guess I'm not, I'm not medical at all. I, I'm just trying to get a little, scratch the surface a little deeper. Like, what is it we've contracted that's... What is it doing to our body? What, it's, well, you the, know what the I mean? body will, it, the, the virus itself will irritate your, will make your system sick. So the virus comes in and it irritates your mucous membranes in your nose. Kind of like children. Right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. They, they yeah. irritate your system. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So it would, it, it irritates it. Your body's mechanism of trying to rid yourself of the, the irritation would be to sneeze. It contains. Could you do that with children? <laughs> no, yes, no, go ahead. I'm sorry. No. I just like uh, you just get rid of the truth. Just sneeze. But yeah, I, I digress here. I'm going the wrong way. I'm trying to make this honest. I want this to be a serious level of understanding. I'm just having fun. But so it's like something that is it in your blood or is, is it in the moisture in your body? What what is it in? It, if your body ends up taking it on in your in your blood and whatnot, and your body tries to fight it. So lots of your symptoms and whatnot is your body's way of trying to fight. The virus itself trying to rid itself and it's airborne when you initially get it mm -hmm. so it's an airborne uh, let's say attack correct an airborne attack that that's we why it's call, so important to isolate uh, that yourself. we call it a virus is that what it is mm -hmm. we're calling it the flu is the reaction to the virus right you're the, flu the germ is, so it's, it isn't the it's virus a, it's the, re what the flu is, is short for influenza okay and what is influenza it's a virus <laughs> <laughs> So we don't, so we, but what we think of as the flu is the reaction to the virus. Is the symptoms that you the get. The symptoms mm -hmm. that we get. So list the symptoms again. What are they? Oh, gosh. They, they could be cold symptoms, um, body aches, fever, 
um, joint aches and pains. Um, it, it can be pretty debilitating for, for people. Some, some people don't get it as badly as others, but particularly the elderly population is at risk, or the very, very young is at risk, or people who are immunosuppressed, which means that their bodies don't, can't fight disease or germs as easily as others. So some people can get a worse reaction or worse symptoms than, than someone else. Okay. So do you guys recommend the flu shot? Yes. Yes, absolutely. And, and do you give the flu shot, and what does it cost if you do? We do do um, flu shots. We've had three clinics this year. Um, yes, and a few mini clinics. And a few mini, <laughs> and a few mini clinics. Um, so if somebody was watching the show right now, and they're, now they're sufficiently worried that someone has sneezed on them, <laughs> and, and they say, I wonder if I could call yeah. them oh, absolutely. perhaps this afternoon at 4, yes. on Thursday afternoon if, at 4, mm -hmm. um, and would I be able to get a flu shot? Yes, and they they could call us. We have about 40 doses left. Um, out of we, I think we had started off with like 360 doses. We have 40 left. And, and when you do this, right, you take like a nail about this big <laughs> and a hammer and you just drive that into somebody's arm, it's right? It's very simple. Everyone's always like, oh, that was nothing. So it's very simple. <laughs> they come up here. It takes two seconds um, up to the public health office on, so in the town hall. Second floor, second town floor, hall, town there's an hall. elevator. Call to make yes. sure there's a nurse there. We have our number, so just give us a call. There is an elevator. Um, and it takes two seconds. They and fill out a form and it's free. We do, we would, if you have an insurance card, we'll accept it. We can bill for it. You will not get a copay. We would never deny anybody a flu shot if they had no insurance. Right. So come on up and get your flu shot. We've had a few people, um, especially since the news has been really uh, publicizing right. the, um, the flu, we've had Every day we have like one or two people coming in that decided to wait till this point to get the, the flu shot. So you shot. bring up a point, is it too late? No, no. it's not too late. It's um, not too late? It's, it takes, um, sometimes you'll see a peak of the flu in like in February, sometimes you'll even see it going into March. So right now I've been following the, um, the uh, Department of Public Health reports. Um, there was actually a drop this past week in reports in Massachusetts of the flu. They're not sure if it's gonna to continue to drop and if we've already hit a plateau or if it's gonna go back up again. Because I know everything on the news is saying how, you know, it's really, the, the uh, flu has really escalated. Massachusetts we're seeing right now, this past week according to reports, it hasn't, but who knows? Sometimes all of a sudden it will flare up again. So it's not too, too late. Come in and get your flu shot. It will definitely protect you um, from, possible flu. Uh, for, for people that are concerned that it's not as effective as some years, um, they say it's better than not getting it because what it does is it actually kind of stimulates your body to be ready to fight for an infection, the flu shot. It actually kind of says it kind of primes your, your system to be ready to go into action if you get uh, exposed to so the that, flu. So that's like if you think you might be walking somewhere where you're going to whack your head, you should whack yourself right now? <laughs> no. I mean, just to prime yourself? Like <laughs> no. In other words, it gets you, it's going to get your um, antibodies kind of ready to be ready in fight mode. So kind of like a pre-game warm-up. Yes. Uh, kind of like, I like that, like that analogy better. Uh -huh. Kind of like the pre-game warm-up. Exactly. All right. So the top three places, Teresa, that you want to avoid, and I'm thinking I'll give you one, so you're going to have to come up with four because I'm going to give you one in the airplane. <laughs> right. Airplanes okay. are good places to avoid. If, <laughs> if, you're, if you're sick or if you're trying to avoid getting sick, public places. Um, people who are, are sick, they don't belong at work. Kids, when they're sick, they belong home. I mean, think about a child going to school sick. School buses. They're in the, they're in the, room, <laughs> they're in the room with a bunch of other children, and that's how, that's how you, they all and they obviously, all sick. But school, yeah. work... Um, any other big public places, you know, you don't, don't go to the movies <laughs> if, you're, if you're sneezing and you have the flu. You're right. not going to probably feel like going, but those are some good places right. to avoid. Right, if you have the flu, we don't want people to stay home just because they're afraid of catching the flu, but right. be, 
be wise. I mean, like you notice, like if you go to the supermarket, they have like the things you can wash the, if everyone's been touching the handle on the grocery cart, you know, oh, yeah. you can use those. At Target, they, I went yeah, in there so and they had a big you know, thing wash you it, you, the Use your, if you can't get, wash your hands afterwards after handling like a lot of uh, public things, you know, make sure you wash your hands good or do the hand sanitizer. Just being a little aware before you eat, you might, if you're in a restaurant, you know, use your hand sanitizer, you know, surfaces might be able to be, you know, if somebody had been there and had been sick. But we don't want people to be paranoid. But obviously, if you have the flu, you don't want to go out and spread all your, your germs to everybody else. Well, maybe else. you do. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> don't like, you don't like people. You yeah, know, maybe. You never know what kind of person's out there. Right. So well, let me you know, take us in a different direction. So, Teresa, I'm going to ask you, how's it changed from 20 years ago? And then I'm going to come to you and ask you, what's it going to look like in 20 years? So, like, how has doing this kind of care in... in Let's even, you could focus on worrying about flus from 20 years ago to now. What's the change been? I'm not the person to ask that because I wasn't doing this 20 <laughs> years ago. That's probably a better question for Janice. Well, how, how about health care in general? Though, yeah, you're not getting off that easy, okay? <laughs> so, so what's changed in health care over the last 20 years that, you, that might benefit the audience to know? And, or maybe how can you better handle it now? Or, or just take an, take an angle and, and give us something because I'm not letting you off. Let's see. I think the big, a big thing that's changed in healthcare and that we're going to be coming up with um, at the Stroke Visiting Nurses is something that you mentioned earlier in computers. Technology has become a big part of, of healthcare in capturing um, medical information and whatnot. Where we used to be so reliant on, on paper documentation, the technology age has moved us into electronic medical records. Um, you see that, and you see that as a negative in one regard. When you go into the hospital, you feel like you're interfacing with yeah, a computer. Yeah, I feel like they're not getting to the point. All they want is information, and they're forgetting, why am I here? I'm here in front of you. There's no soul that's behind it. It just seems like, oh, I got a job. I'm sorry. Gotta... As a matter of fact, my last physical was about three weeks ago. And I won't mention the healthcare agency so I don't get in trouble. But um, as soon as I got there, they handed me an iPad. And they said, okay, fill that out. And it's all wow. like, finger that all out. And, and then there was no like how you, well, they weren't, there was no rudeness. I, I don't want to say that, but it was the technology controlled the meeting. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and the other part I really disliked was in doing that, it made the entire encounter linear mm -hmm. so that they got to shape the questions and you had to follow the format. You couldn't go from, you couldn't, you couldn't go outside of, okay, you've done number one, now you gotta do number two. Well, I wanna talk about this. No, no, you gotta do four, five, six, and seven. Whether or not they mean anything to me, whether or not it's germane to the reason I'm visiting, that had to be done. It was intimidating, mm. I didn't like it, I think out no. of the box, and that was so in the box. So tell me. So you're, you you're saying that it wasn't patient driven? It they, all, would, it was no, they argue driven. that it is pa patient driven. They argue that. It, the they is right. the medical community argues that that is pa patient driven. But I suggest that that is no soul and lots of technology. But it, it, feels, it feels a little cold. That's a negative. Well, that's go. a negative. It, it felt a little cold. I, I could have <laughs> just saved us all that time on <laughs> camera. I have to tell you, my last <laughs> visit felt a little cold. Take that, it from there. That's a negative piece of it, but there is positive pieces to the to the electronics and the technology of it as well. For instance, way back in the day, when nurses are passing medications and whatnot, it's it's all on paper, and you're busy, and there's problem there's probably more room, there was probably more room for error then. I mean, now you have an electronic device, you scan someone's band, um, if you're, and you scan the medication, and if the database captures that this is not a medication that this patient's supposed to be receiving, it will alert you that you're about to make a medication error. So that's a positive piece to that. Um, I agree with you that sometimes it seems like you're interfacing with a piece of electronics rather than a human being, but I think that's where we as caregivers have to be very careful in not abandoning our compassionate piece of, of care and making sure that we, we capture all those patients' questions and concerns and work it in with that. But it, it's important to capture accurate, consistent medical data as well in treating the patient. I will say that my doctor is fabulous and he provided that piece. 
It's just that the start of the mm -hmm. meeting was um, incredibly stand up. It was incredibly cold. Mm. <laughs> um, but it, it really was, it was like, no, we can't even deal with you till you filled this out. Mm -hmm. And the it's almost like those prompts that you get on when you call up uh, cable or somebody you want to change your service and you can't talk to a person. You, uh, recently I did one where I had to change a service and they said, no, you can't even talk to a person. You have to go to Snapchat and we, won't, mm -hmm. we don't offer any other customer service related. So th there's this piece of it that is becoming very disengaging mm -hmm. and indirect, not to the point, and saving them time and money and not saving you any right. time at all. And I doubt very much we're saving money because, and I want to get to that, what are, well, how is this affecting costs going forward? My understanding is that there's roughly a 6.5% year-to-year increase in medical costs. And with that tapering off over time through technology improvements, but in the meantime, we're, we're um, at a stunning pace of increased costs. Mm -hmm. so, We'll use that to loop right into what I was gonna ask you is, so 20 years from now, there's a new Janice as a director of the VNA. Hopefully mm -hmm. it's still in place, mm -hmm. protecting and helping Stoughton residents. What are the concerns of the new Janice? Oh boy. <laughs> well, I didn't say it would be easy, I said it would be fun. <laughs> I know. But, not, but not easy. Oh, well, you know, I would hope, um, you know, I, looking back at history, you know, Patients never change, their needs never change. Like if you're a human being and you have um, a health concern, you're still a human being, so we still have to address those basic needs. But technology having changed, we can decrease costs hopefully through new technology. Um, like for example, when I first worked for the VNA, it would be nothing for us to go out twice a day to change a dressing. Someone had a bandage the doctor would send us out twice a day. That was very costly for healthcare because you're, you're reimbursing. It used to be, and, and the model of, of reimbursement has changed since then too. Um, but making those nursing visits like twice a day. Now there are new products, um, wound care products that are meant to stay on maybe for three days at a time and they actually promote healing. So in that way you're saving the manpower going out by putting uh, a nice type of bandage on that's meant to stay on and actually um, works better and the patients seem to like it. So that's one way that new products can help decrease the costs. But I agree, when we look at the healthcare system, even in Washington, if you can make heads or tails of, out, out of it right now, mm. you really can't. I mean, there's such a fight over healthcare. I think it has to be woman care, not man, <laughs> woman power, not manpower, by right. the way. I think we have to get rid of that word. It's, right. a, um, it's yeah. a part of the problem. I honestly believe this. It's not like you heard it or heard it here first, but is that it's a male centric um, with doctors right. and as a rule. I mean, not that we don't all right. know women doctors, right. but the, the the whole male centric thing from civilization and power mm -hmm. um, concerns me. That that um, power, you know, corrupts absolutely and all that stuff. So I think that there's um, that that the the soul that we spoke of, that the care that you speak of is um, is better shown, better exhibited in my view by women, and that we need to attribute more power or a glom or, or right. you know, gather more power to women to make right. the changes that would answer your concern about Washington so we can get political right, right now. We could get political well, we could and get really for crazy. That, we? Yes, but we sometimes I think the initiatives that are put out there really don't make sense to me. Like um, like when they say about decreasing like um, say Medicare, Medicaid. Okay. For people. What's the difference for people like me that don't know? What's well, the difference it's Medicaid usually, and Medicare? Medicaid um, is usually like an income-based program for people that don't have other insurances maybe and they fall below a certain um, income level. So that's Medicaid. Medicaid. So it's a health insurance program if your income falls below right, a, level. a certain level. And, and right. And can kind of help you to right. make ends meet exactly. medically. Right? Medicare, most people have put into the system along so the Medicare way. So is Medicare like is Social like, Security. Right, right. And, and it like takes over at age 65. 65, I think right. It is. Yep. 
So, I mean, there's so many different health plans out there, but most people when they're 65 go over to Medicare unless they have a Medicare preferred type of plan with their employment. But for people that may have been disabled and not being able to have employment or hadn't been putting into med the Medicare fund or whatever, they might go on Medicaid. But when they start decreasing Medicaid, then people, if they get really sick, they, they're not going to seek out the care in time and the, they'll end up probably end up going to a higher cost of care, which would be like the emergency room if they're not able to get to a regular doctor's appointment. Okay. So then they're, they're utilized. I think that doesn't make sense. I think the best thing to do is to give people care before things become, before their diseases progress and, and to a bad. you don't feel that's bad. being done with the current... Well, I think trends. when they talk about cutting Medicaid, I think that that's one concern. But there's, again, this would be a very political right. discussion, yeah. <laughs> and okay. I'm probably let not me, the best for community forum. For <laughs> yeah, you probably don't want to do that. But um, you know what I'd like to do right now is um, I think we have some public service announcements, okay. and I'm going to see if uh, Roy Cohen, our producer, who is uh, wonderfully and uh, very generously giving his time, is ready to uh, run those on the program. So, Roy, are you ready? And Hi, it's Gary LaPierre, and the crew wants to thank mm, 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 Maxie's Delicatessen. That's at 117 Sharon Street in Stoughton. They're 781-341-1662. American Cancer Society, yes, they're looking for volunteers, drive cancer patients to and from their treatments. 1-800-ACS-6662 or just go to www.cancer.org. Ilsa Marks Food Pantry in St. Anthony's Free Market, 2 Park Avenue in Stoughton. For more information, call Christine Gallagher. That's at 781-341-0611 or 781-341-0549. Meals on Wheels, just ask for Jessica. You'll find her at 781-344-8882, extension two. Stoughton Penny Saver, our business is advertising your business, they tell us. 27 Rose Glen Street, Stoughton, 781-344-4833. Community Forum Showtimes in Stoughton. It's Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday at 6 p.m., Monday at 8 p.m., Tuesday at 5 p.m. It's on Comcast Channel 9 and Verizon Channel 28. All comments and suggestions welcome. Contact us at communityforum1 at yahoo.com. Samaritans, they're at 41 West Street on the fourth floor in Boston, 02111. Their phone number is 617-536-2460, 24-hour helplines for Samaritans, and the number is 877-870-HOPE. That's 877-870-4673. Samaritans, you can find them at 800-252-TEEN. That's 252 8336 or find them online at samaritanshope.org all right so we're back here in studio with janice bruce the director of the Stoughton public housing and health. also the public health i'm sorry <laughs> not housing health and the vna as well along with teresa Dolov, who is one of the um well not so much uh, a nurse you go out and you do screaming so what would you call that Screening liaison. professional. Liaison. liaison. Community liaison. Liaison. We use that <laughs> French word. It sounds French. Yeah. Is it French? I don't even know. I don't know. Yeah, we'll have to do one of those dictionary looks or whatever. Google. <laughs> so we're back here in studio. Um, and where are we going? Okay, so uh, while we're in studio, we've just been notified that I have to do some PSAs. Public Service Announcements is a new show on SMAC, Stoughton Media Access Cable. It's called We Are United. It's a wonderful show. It's on Mondays at 5 p.m. Tuesdays at 9 a.m., Wednesdays 8.30 p.m., Fridays at 11 a.m., and that's Comcast, Channel 9, Verizon, Channel 28. Also, Stoughton's own cooking show where you can learn how to cook all kinds of home-cooked things with home-cooked with natural vegetables. I know that's a, it's a real positive thing. It's called Get Fresh, and with new episodes, Comcast, Channel 9, Verizon, Channel 28. You guys will have this memorized in no time. Monday at 5.30 p.m., Wednesdays at 8 p.m., Thursdays at 9 a.m., and Fridays at 5 p.m. And by the way, if, this, if the uh, print gets any smaller, I won't be reading it to you. <laughs> You'll have to read it for yourselves. Hometown Business Show, Tuesdays at 11 a.m., Wednesdays at 5.30 p.m., Thursdays at 8 p.m., Sundays at 7 p.m., 
Comcast, Channel 9, Verizon, Channel 28. And uh, we're back with the Stoughton Public Health Association and visiting nurses. That's on the second floor at 10 Pearl Street at the Town Hall in Stoughton. Their office number is 781-344-7011. You can call and converse with a nurse on Thursday afternoons, 4 to 6. And on the uh, Hometown Business Show, we actually have another little program coming up today with Tom Padovina, who's doing a, uh, a couple of uh, music concerts that he's trying to produce. So that'll be one of the next shows that we're going to um, share with you. So back in studio, um, I hadn't quite got a, like a full answer on the, the way the v is heading in the future. So kind of touch upon that, bring us uh, a little closer to an answer on that. Well, the, tr the trends for home health care right now are called patient-centered health care. That's where they're feeling like outcomes of, of care are really being measured and um, this is how they're assessing how well agencies are doing. They, and how, who's they? Well, this is um, how they're, they're. The, the healthcare field, the, again, Medicare, it seems to drive a lot of our um, quality improvement measures um, in the um, health and health services, health and human services in Washington. So patient-centered patient health Patient-centered health care. Patient-centered, what does that mean? So what that means is they felt often that people are being taken care of but not really being part of their health care. And they're trying to... <laughs> so they give them a computer. Yes, yeah, so this is out. what exactly what <laughs> you were talking about. I think that sounds like not really great patient-centered care. I think so too. I mean, I'm, I'm experiencing it where I didn't even need that part at my last thing. All I needed was to go see the doctor who was great. Right. I, I think what they're trying to do is to make the patient be the center and they tell us what kind of um, goals they have for their own, per, for their own personal health care what's important to them. Because we can go in there and assume like that this is what they want and need, but sometimes you're not looking at what their, their actual lifestyle is and what their personal goals are for healthcare. So it's really kind of including a person more and working around them. The doctors, the nurses, the therapists are keeping the patient as the center of it rather than going in and telling you what you need to do. It's having a discussion with somebody and finding out what's important to them, what, what their lifestyle is. Of course, we're gonna to try to do health improvements, but to include them and not exclude the patient, because oftentimes you see a picture like of all the, like somebody laying in a bed and all the technicians and everything, the patient's not even being part of the process. Yeah. So to me, the computers, and of course anybody that's pushing computers mm -hmm. that might be listening is thinking that I'm a terrible person right now, mm -hmm. but Computers is not the inclusion piece. Right. Where they, they want to make that, and I, um, so to listen, I, um, one of my wonderful students described listening for me. His name is Liam Lee, and he said, to listen is to liberate yourself from your own thinking. Oh, I like it's that. It's a That's wonderful great. definition. It's excellent. I, I just, have, it stuck to me, one of the, the smartest things I've ever heard. Um, and I don't think a computer can do that. Right. A computer can't listen, right. can't liberate itself. It, it has a task, you can't get out of the task. Mm -hmm. All you can do is get to the it, next it's, stage. It's funny that you should talk about this because we are gonna be transitioning t soon from paper records in the home to um, having a, a device of either a iPad or a laptop. And that is one of the concerns of all the uh, clinicians. They're, they're like, oh, it just seems like it's gonna be so impersonal, it's gonna seem so unfriendly. And I said, I think it depends on how we are able to manage it. I say, you always go in and find out first conversation how someone's doing before yeah. you get into that device. See, I think it's the approach. Whoever gave you that iPad, I think they should have, or that thing, I think they should have done a little explaining, explaining to you about what this purpose was for that and include you and say, you know, give me feedback on this. I think that that's the missing piece. Well, I think that, okay, so in some, and maybe this is just a personality piece on me and I apologize, but if it's, amounts to, and it's not intended to, but if it amounts to a lie, it doesn't have an effect. Okay, now you, you can tell me what you want about right. this, right. but 
when you ask me my social security number three times, right? right? right. I'm, you're wasting my time. Right. Okay, in other words, you've already got this information. You, right. you know all this information. So now you're getting me to input it right. under the auspices of doing a better job. Right. So if the base level of understanding of intent isn't true right. and natural to what you're trying to accomplish, right. then I don't see it having the effect right. that you want it to have. And it, we are going to try very hard not to have that type of a setup, that's for sure. And we won't be handing anybody a device to be filling things out when we well, go in. Well, I'm not sure you it's know? totally wrong. It's just it's the culture right. that we talked about earlier exactly. has to embrace I mean, change, right? right? So uh, former British Prime Minister Harold Wilson, I, I love this quote. He said that if you do not embrace change, you become the architect of decay. Mm -hmm. So given that yeah. sentiment, yeah, we have to get in line, but it's how you do something, not right, and what exactly. you do, mm -hmm. and how the, the, um, the, how it parallels, no, how it, um, how it aligns right. with your true purpose. If your true purpose is simply to cut costs to make more money as mm -hmm. a medical organization, right. then and that's what appears to be often the case, right. then you're not really, you're not really gonna get better care. Right. You're gonna get better, better cost right. savings. Right. So. And well, you know, we feel like we're, we would have been very happy to stay on paper, but unfortunately it's going away in the healthcare industry. We have, yeah. we have to move to yeah, the electronics. Just, it's the just because it's, it's just what's expected yep. is to be part of it, and hopefully it will increase communications and streamline processes. But everybody is concerned about the fact that they don't want it to become a barrier between that the patient and the nurse or the clinician. They want to be able to not be looking at the computer screen, but be, to be looking at the patient. So, you know, we're going to all develop our own techniques, but we hope to be able to actually have someone come in and give us some help on ways that we can maintain that personal connection without being able to enter your information but keep it personal. So it's going to be a little challenge. It's new. It's going to be something different, but I think it's time because if not, we'll probably get fined. Yeah. So, <laughs> but it's, I think what, it, uh, what maybe speaks to is structure. So uh, in the same way that um, this table that we're seated at um, creates the conveyance of uh, certain characteristics. Right. Like for instance, if this table had more of a four, um, like four points of interest, what it seems to have is uh, a, a linear two point almost. Mm -hmm. And that changes how we can talk, right? right. So, um, but if we were shaped in a four, the cameras were here, then it almost would shape our conversation. So that, so that structure, um, you know, for instance, if I like reach over and I'm a little farther away and at a different angle, it would have a different impression right. than if I'm talking to you and, and right like right. this. So right. how does healthcare achieve the structure that you're looking to get? Um, and like, how does it balance that structure to get the result? Right. Um, what do you think, Teresa? You've been kind of listening patiently. You know, I think in terms of, it's a tool. The whole electronic piece of it is, is a tool, and I guess like with any tool that anyone uses, it has to be used appropriately to, to get the result it is that you want. While listening to you, to you both speak, you know, I screen patients and I also call patients to see how their care is going, and one of the strongest points that comes out of it in terms of patients liking stoke visiting nurses is it's a very personal approach. They, and I've had patients say, oh, I was with a different home care before, and they just came in and they played with their computer, or, and they didn't, you know, I, exactly I didn't feel like they, I didn't feel like they, they paid attention and whatnot, and I, I love my, my nurses, my nurses meaning the Stoughton visiting nurses and whatnot, but um, I think it's important to just remember that it's a tool, and it has to be used appropriately like, like any other tool, and I think it can be incorporated to capture what we need to capture with it, and still have that compassionate, face-to-face, patient-centered care. So I think what I, I think what it aligns with for me is that what you're saying is that if the true reason that you're there is patient care, 
that will be prioritized over the computer use. Absolutely. And I think what I've experienced is the true reason that the technology was there is to save the, the uh, company and the industry money. Mm. And that's right. why that's why the feelings are like there's right. a like a vibration there that I'm pushing back right. because I'm not getting any feeling that they're interested in saving right. in, in saving me. They want to save money right. and I'm in their way. Right. And that's what that technology and you can tell by the way the questions are asked and by the redundancies. Like what like it's okay they don't want to have any redundancy, but it's okay if they give me a thousand redundancies. Right. And so that so what you're saying is it's very important that the priorities are in place right. so that the patient care, so that you create value for the patient, not for the organization. Exactly. Even though the, for the organization right. to be healthy, it has to have value too. Right. Well, I, that's one um, thing that we, you know, we're in the, t we're owned by the town. And mm -hmm. of course we work out through the town budget. But again, it's the value of the services. Obviously, you, you don't want to cost somebody a lot of money to to have an agency but really it's the value we bring to the town in providing services that are caring and a good link with other um, with other departments and to really care for our senior population I think it's just really an important feature uh, because it always comes down to dollars and cents of how we run and operate uh, but it's really again we have a lot of people that will say well no, we really feel that we are getting a lot of value to have this organization to be there for a resource, to be there to provide to provide care to people, to um, just it just strengthens your community. So, what do you say to the fiscal conservatives who say, "Tell me what it would cost to not have you here"? So, in other words, <laughs> like if we don't have you here, we're yeah. going to have a, a v, another VNA. Where do you stand on the spectrum? Can you? Uh, am I putting you on a really hot seat that no. says, you know, oh, well, actually, we're 10% higher, but we're worth it, or is it we're right in line, or are we saving you money? What do you say to the fiscal conservatives who have real questions? And uh, I count myself among that a little bit mm -hmm. in that I have properties right. in town. I don't want the taxes right. to go up too high. Right. So real quick, well, I know I don't, that's but, like well, maybe another show. No, but, well, we're in budget season right now in the yeah. town. Okay, so maybe it's appropriate. And I went up before um, the selectmen last was a week or two ago to present our budget. I am very proud to say that Stoughton Public Health Association runs totally supported with the revenues we bring in from um, our patient services. Beautiful. We cover our, all of our direct costs, we cover all, cover all of our salaries, and we cover all of our expenses. However, being an enterprise fund, which is where we put our mm -hmm. uh, revenues, we had a huge enterprise fund at one point of excess revenues. It's now dwindling every year because they're pulling that for our indirect costs, which uh, we pay for, um, because we have the enterprise mm -hmm. fund, we have to pay for a portion of expenses for uh, the pensions. Okay. We have to pay for so rent. I, I think we're going to make another show of it. I'm yeah. going to ask you to kind of like, we'll come in again. Yeah. Um, I'm getting a little signal from uh, from my earpiece that okay. we're, going, we're running over oh, on time. Oh, we're running time. over. Right. Okay. Yeah, I don't want to get too much on that. But okay. I think we're doing, I think Stoughton's doing pretty good with what right. we have right now. Well, I want to thank you, Janice. And you, Teresa, for coming in. Thank I also you. want to thank the audience for paying attention. And uh, I look forward to another show on this wonderful topic. Thank you, Leo McGowan in the background. Uh, well wishes for Gina Coe as she's recovering. Also, Roy Cohen out back, Dave Young, Jeff Pickett, and Mike Hammond. Thank you all for watching. Thank you.